former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg has announced that he will not run for president in 2020. He will not. After initially declaring that he would not run for president in 2020, Michael Bloomberg filed paperwork to qualify for the Alabama primary in time to meet the deadline. This action, followed soon after by filings in other states, has prompted many to speculate that the billionaire is seriously considering changing his mind about running, and his spokespeople have said that he would be making up his mind soon. Were Bloomberg to declare a run, he would reportedly have at least one supporter. Jeff Bezos, the world's richest person who apparently encouraged his fellow billionaire to run during a phone call earlier this year. To win the presidency, Bloomberg would of course have to begin by winning the Democratic primary contest. In this video, I will lay out five serious problems he would face if he were to join the race. Now before I launch into this, I want to be straight up about my bias. I think that the fact that Bloomberg is even considering a run is an unsavory indicator of the times that we now live in. I do not trust the ability of any billionaire to empathize with or understand the problems of ordinary Americans. I find it incredibly difficult to believe that any billionaire is likely to favor policy that would help working class people over the interests of their own economic class and the corporations they often own, work for, and or own stock in. And I find it difficult to believe that a billionaire will faithfully act in the national interest of America over and above their own financial interests. Beyond that, regardless of their propensity to support policy that would widen the already unconscionable wealth gap in America, I believe there are serious symbolic issues with having a billionaire in the Oval Office. Bloomberg is the fourth billionaire after Donald Trump, Howard Schultz, and Tom Steyer to seriously consider a 2020 run. Were Bloomberg to secure the Democratic nomination, the 2020 election would be the first general election contest between two billionaires in American history. A disheartening blow to the notion that anyone in America can grow up to become the President of the United States. So for full disclosure, even if a billionaire were to propose the perfect policies and somehow prove a faithful commitment to them, I would still be hesitant. Michael Bloomberg does not pose such a moral quandary for me as I am in general disagreement about much of his ideology. But to be quite clear, I am biased to begin with. The very fact that he is a billionaire means that even if he were to be running on a platform I loved, I would still have to seriously mull over the idea of supporting him and ask myself, is it worth it? To begin with, were Michael Bloomberg to join the presidential race, he must contend with the fact that he might be a spoiler candidate for more popular moderate Democrats, like Joe Biden and Pete Buttigieg. I don't generally like spoiler arguments, but the fact is that he avoided running in 2016 for that very reason. He opted to back Clinton rather than running himself because he wanted to unite in common cause against Donald Trump. Were Bloomberg to join the current Democratic primary, he does so mainly to oppose progressive candidates like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, both of whom propose wealth taxes for billionaires like Bloomberg. Theoretically, were Bloomberg to make the debate stage itself a somewhat dubious potentiality, he would use this time to rail against the progressive movement and perhaps bolster candidates more favorable to his own ideology. However, were he to draw support, there is no doubt where he would be most likely to draw it from, Joe Biden, who is similar ideologically and demographically and has the most support to lose. So were Bloomberg to be extremely successful and become a major contender, he would very likely split Biden's base of support in the process, thus improving the chances of Warren and Sanders, the very candidates he would join the race to stop. That said, splitting the vote is the least of Bloomberg's troubles. It's a theoretical problem for anyone joining any race. It's also not likely to become a real problem, as to split the vote you have to draw supporters, and Bloomberg is not likely to do that effectively. One obvious problem for Michael Bloomberg is that he is entering the race late. John Delaney was the first to declare his candidacy at the end of July of 2017, and by the end of April 2019, all of the major candidates had already declared. Candidates who declared after Joe Biden include Bullock, Sestak, Steyer, and de Blasio, none of whom have so far been able to gain serious traction. One of them has actually already dropped out, and two of them might as well have, as they have failed to keep pace with the DNC's rules for making the debate stage. Aside from this anecdotal evidence, there is good reason to suggest that any newcomer to the race would have a tough time. 
An October YouGov HuffPost poll found that 83% of Democratic voters were already satisfied with or enthusiastic about the current field of presidential choices. With so late an entry into the contest among a field of highly liked candidates, Bloomberg would have to have an incredible plan to gain sufficient momentum to secure the nomination. According to his advisor Howard Wolfson, however, Bloomberg's plan would be to not campaign in early caucus and primary states like Iowa and New Hampshire, but instead to focus on Super Tuesday. The last time a Democratic candidate won the nomination without winning one of the first two state contests was in 1972. That was a strange primary contest. McGovern won the nomination despite the fact that Humphrey won the popular vote, and it was a very different time. The second contest was Florida, and half the states did not have a caucus or primary. I'm not going to say that avoiding the early contests is a stupid idea, but history shows that no one has ever won by skipping straight to Super Tuesday, since Super Tuesday began in 1984. So were Bloomberg to join the race, he'd be joining astoundingly late, competing against already popular competitors and doing so with an implausible strategy. To pull off a victory in the face of all this, Bloomberg would have to capture a kind of magic that transcends conventional thinking. But does Bloomberg represent all that Americans love? Uh, not so much. If you made a list of things that just about all Americans love, that list may look something like this. Nowhere on anyone's list would we see Wall Street, the mainstream media, or power-hungry billionaires. Yet Bloomberg manages to be all three in just one person. Michael Bloomberg began his career on Wall Street and made his fortune largely through the Bloomberg Terminal, the financial information computer that has become a fixture of Wall Street trading floors. Selling these terminals, Bloomberg's company became massively successful, and he became one of the wealthiest people in the world. He then conceived of Bloomberg Business News, originally a way of expanding the services provided through his terminals. Before long, Bloomberg had a small media empire, Bloomberg Media Group, with magazines, a 24-hour business network, a radio service, and online platforms. Not satisfied by the power he accrued in the worlds of finance and media, Bloomberg also began a political career, becoming the 108th mayor of New York in 2001 and serving three terms. He also teased making a run for president in 2016 as an independent before eventually endorsing Hillary Clinton. If Bloomberg's threat of running as an independent in 2016 sounds familiar, it may be because another billionaire, Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz, tried the same tact this election cycle before realizing that there was no clamor for an arrogant, inexperienced billionaire. Schultz announced that he would not run in September of 2019. But as veteran GOP propagandist Frank Luntz points out, Howard Schultz is not Mike Bloomberg. Mike Bloomberg has shown his willingness to invest in the campaign. He's shown his willingness to be tough enough to be able to take the criticism, which Howard Schultz was not. Still another billionaire, Tom Steyer, is investing significant swaths of his own money, backing his own run for the Democratic nomination. Despite his massive spending, he is currently pulling in 11th place, at 1.0% in the RCP averages. Meanwhile, two of the top three candidates, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, have largely built their political brands, railing against the undue power of the billionaire class. Together, Sanders and Warren represent 38% of Democratic support, a full 10 points ahead of the frontrunner, Joe Biden. But one thing that separates Bloomberg from Schultz or Steyer is the fact that he's been a politician before. A mayor has never made a direct leap to the Oval Office before, but there is no doubt that Bloomberg's experience as New York City mayor makes him at least as prepared for the presidency as South Bend mayor, Pete Buttigieg, who is currently polling in fourth place. So while Bloomberg's political experience may be distinctly less substantial than typical presidents, who tend to have experience as senators or governors or secretaries of state, his mayoral experience may clear the bar, perhaps substantially lowered in light of the fact that the current president, also a billionaire, had zero experience in politics when he beat the candidate that Bloomberg backed in 2016. Bloomberg's ties to Wall Street and the mainstream media may be negative indicators for his potential in this race, as would his billionaire status. But as far as billionaires go, he is not likely to be quite as clownish a candidate as the billionaires we've seen before. Unlike Steyer and Schultz, Bloomberg can call himself an experienced politician. But as far as experience goes, his may not be the kind 
that the Democratic electorate is looking for. As with most things, experience is more about quality than quantity. Valuable experience for a politician means having accomplishments to boast about, or at least a track record of making the right decisions. When it comes to decision making, Bloomberg has many vulnerabilities. He supported George W. Bush for president, he supported the Iraq war, and has been a staunch supporter of free trade with China, habitually turning a blind eye to Chinese protectionism and currency manipulation. But of all the policies associated with Bloomberg, one stands out more than any other, stop and frisk. The issue has been talked about in recent opinion pieces about Bloomberg that have come out in the New York Times and the Washington Post, and will thus likely be talked about ad nauseum by cable news pundits, should the billionaire declare himself a presidential candidate. When the constitutionality of stop and frisk was challenged in federal court, the presiding judge Shira Scheinlin considered statistics of police stops between 2004 and 2019. Here were some of those. After assessing these statistics, Judge Scheinlin ruled that the procedure itself was not unconstitutional, but the way the NYPD carried it out was. Targeting young black and Hispanic men for stops based on alleged criminal conduct of other young black or Hispanic men violates bedrock principles of equality. In response to the ruling, Bloomberg wrote a Washington Post editorial called Stop and Frisk Keeps New York Safe, in which he called the judge an ideologically driven federal judge who has a history of ruling against the police. He also tied the stop and frisk policy directly to saving lives, writing, Never once in the judge's 197-page opinion did she mention the lives that have been saved because of the stops those officers made. And he claimed, when it comes to policing, political correctness is deadly. But Bloomberg's fear-mongering about the need for stop and frisk is not substantiated by recent crime statistics. The NYPD's own data has found no increase in serious crime as a result of declining numbers of police stops. As Politico has reported, the number of reported police stops have dropped by a total of 98% since their peak in 2011. In that time, homicides have decreased 43%, while major index crimes have declined 9%. Perhaps more politically damaging than the fact that Bloomberg was absolutely wrong about stop and frisk is the fact that the policy is poison to black and Latino voters. As The Atlantic reported in 2016, in a 2012 Quinnipiac poll, 7 in 10 black New Yorkers opposed stop and frisk. In 2013, Marist found an even higher proportion, 75%, wanted an overhaul. In a primary contest where reparations are being discussed, and multiple candidates have proposed plans for dealing with systemic racism, Bloomberg will very easily be seen as part of the problem. Were he somehow to become the Democratic nominee over the objections of black and Latino voters, Bloomberg's nomination would very likely clear the way for a Trump victory. As Jonathan Cape of the Washington Post explains, Trump was the first Republican to win Wisconsin since 1984. He did so by about 23,000 votes. Black voter turnout in that state plunged from 74% in 2012 to 55.1% in 2016. Voter suppression efforts played a part, but so did distaste for the candidates. It is difficult to imagine how the Democrats could beat Donald Trump without recovering at least part of the Rust Belt states, which voted for both Obama and Trump. To do so, the party must inspire greater turnout from black voters, a task that would be virtually impossible with a candidate so inextricably tied to the NYPD's stop and frisk policy. This is a double blow to Bloomberg's chances in the Democratic primary race. Opposition from people of color and their allies doesn't just mean losing their votes in the primaries, it also means losing the votes of whites who take electability to be a determinative factor when choosing a nominee. Losing the votes of people of color would be enough to end the presidential ambitions of most potential Democratic nominees. The only thing more fatal to a potential campaign would be to alienate a full 50% of the American electorate. When it comes to his past with women, Bloomberg may have already done just that. Michael Bloomberg boasted in his 1997 autobiography that he kept a girlfriend in every city during the 60s and 70s, and has claimed chasing women to be one of his favorite things to do. In a 2013 feature in New York Magazine, Bloomberg is quoted as responding to being thanked for his positions on gun control this way. Without even acknowledging the comment, Bloomberg gestured toward a woman in a very tight floor-length gown standing nearby, and said, 
Look at the ass on her. In 1990, colleagues gifted him with a booklet called Portable Bloomberg, the wit and wisdom of Michael Bloomberg. One piece of wit the volume contained was the following hilarious joke. If women wanted to be appreciated for their brains, they'd go to the library instead of to Bloomingdale's. Look, I'd be happy to accept an offensive joke where the joke discernibly funny in any way whatsoever. While I'm not particularly offended as a supporter of women, I am, in the words of Jerry Seinfeld, offended as a comedian. Here's another piece of Bloomberg wit. When he noticed a sales representative at his company wearing an engagement ring, he is alleged to have said to her, What is this guy, dumb and blind? What the hell is he marrying you for? That's according to a suit filed by that sales representative in the 1990s. She also claimed that later when she told Bloomberg that she was pregnant, he replied by saying this. Bloomberg denied that he ever made those comments, but did concede that he said of her and several other women at the company, I do her. There have been far too many discrimination and harassment suits filed against Bloomberg and his company to sufficiently detail here. Several suits of this nature were filed in the 1990s and beyond. In 2008, at least 58 women filed a class action lawsuit against Bloomberg LP alleging pregnancy discrimination, which included demotions, cut salaries, and other mistreatment. In 1998, a woman filed a suit against Bloomberg LP after an executive allegedly forced himself on her. Bloomberg himself claimed that he wouldn't believe the woman without an unimpeachable third-party witness. A similar case was filed in 2013 with another female victim and another Bloomberg executive. That suit alleged the multiple attacks she suffered were assisted in part by a hostile work environment and a pattern of discrimination and harassment from multiple leaders in the company. Now, it would be unreasonable to hold Bloomberg responsible to the worst acts of violence against women perpetrated by executives at his company. But it does seem to me fair to hold him at least partially responsible for the apparently perpetually misogynistic culture of his company and 100% responsible for his personal history of demeaning and misogynistic comments. After learning about the history of Bloomberg and his company's treatment of women, it would be difficult to imagine that any kind of enthusiasm for his campaign would come from well-informed female voters. But forget how Bloomberg's past will affect his popularity going forward. With his relatively high name recognition, current opinion polling about Bloomberg already paints a pretty vivid picture. According to polling by Morning Consult, were Michael Bloomberg to join the race today, he would be polling in sixth place, between Kamala Harris and Andrew Yang, with 4% of the vote. Given the large field overall and the fact that candidates tend to experience a surge after declaring their candidacy, these numbers don't look altogether horrible for Bloomberg. After all, we saw Pete Buttigieg rise to fourth place out of almost total obscurity, and he's currently polling in second place in Iowa. But while unknown candidates can join a race and gain significantly in the polls as people learn who they are, Bloomberg's single-digit status has little to do with any lack of name recognition. Again, according to Morning Consult, were he to run, Bloomberg would enter the 2020 Democratic contest with higher name recognition among the party's electorate than 11 current contenders, including fellow billionaire Tom Steyer of California. But Bloomberg does have baggage, with a quarter of likely Democratic primary voters expressing unfavorable views of him, higher than any of the 15 candidates already in the race. Data from 538 confirms this. While his name recognition is on par with Cory Booker and Kamala Harris, who enjoy net approval ratings in the mid-30s, Bloomberg's net approval is less than a third of theirs. So not only does Bloomberg already have high name recognition, meaning he has little room to grow beyond the 4% support he might already enjoy, were he to join the race, he would be beginning his run as the most hated candidate in the field. For years now, Michael Bloomberg has been teasing presidential runs. There is no doubt that he wants to become president. But to even have a chance of winning, Bloomberg would have to give up a great deal of privacy, face enormous criticism, expend a small fortune of his personal wealth, and submit himself to an exhausting process, with debates, rallies, interviews, and behind-the-scenes efforts of building an effective campaign team. All this, and he would still face incredibly long odds for even becoming a top contender for the Democratic nomination. Were he somehow able to secure that, he would then face the even more exhausting process 
of running in the general against a notoriously vicious and energetic rival. Not to mention, actually being the president is a stressful, mostly thankless task. Bloomberg may very well want to become president, but given all he would have to go through to even get a remote chance of winning that prize, I wonder if he's ever asked himself, is it worth it?